Good everyone. If I could once again interrupt the wonderful evening we're having. So did everyone enjoy dinner? Good time. Good. As we finish up dessert service, and before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to take just a moment to acknowledge some other folks that are here with us this evening. This is, as many of you know, this has become one of our signature programs, and one of the reasons it's so successful is because of the ongoing participation of a number of people in this room who have served as volunteers and leaders in helping us pave the way, not just for Winter College, but for other innovative and creative alumni programming. So, I'd like to ask everyone in this room who has served as a member of the Alumni Association Board of Directors or is serving, or who has served or is serving as a member of the Foundation Board of Directors to please stand for all and be recognized. While I don't have currently with us this evening the, the sitting president of the Alumni Association Board, I would like to recognize the sitting president of the Foundation Board who is with us, Susan Knotts. <laughs> All right, so now on to the keynote event. We have something very, very special for you this evening. Those of you who have been with us for past Winter College programs know that we have had an interesting array of speakers over the years. Uh, one of our former speakers is in the room this evening, Congressman Mike Oxley. So, Congressman. So we've had congressmen, we've had leaders of business and industry, we have had an ambassador from Luxembourg to China. We had last year the vice president of sports for NBC. We've had a lot of very interesting, very successful alumni who have spoken to you and shared their life experiences and their experience born of their Miami education. Tonight we're going in a very different direction. We have, without question, the youngest keynote speaker we have ever brought to Winter College. You are about to be amazed. Certainly I will tell you that I have been amazed. Rachel Rudwall class of 2008. Rachel has bachelor's degrees from Miami in international studies and in Spanish. Since leaving Miami in 2008, she has done things that certainly I and I suspect many of you could only imagine if you even dared to dream it. But Rachel didn't just dare to dream it, she dared to do it and set off on an adventure unlike anything, uh, frankly, that I can believe. Today she is an on-camera host, a producer, a camera operator, a world traveler, and just an all-around crazy person traveling the world, doing things that I just cannot believe someone so recently out of school is doing, let alone anyone else. She was part of the first class of what the Alumni Association started two years ago called 18 of the Last Nine. Now some of you are familiar with 30 under 30 or 40 under 40 programs that attempt to recognize younger people for their successful achievements. We put our own personal spin on that. 1809, of course, being the founding year for Miami. We recognize 18 graduates who have graduated within the last nine years. And Rachel was among that first group of 18. It's been an amazing program for us because it's enabled us to identify alumni, young alumni in particular, that frankly we didn't know were out there doing these amazing things in the world. Rachel has set out to leave her mark on the travel industry in a lot of ways. She has established a, an online, a blog type program called How To Travelers. How To Travelers Today Online has 42,000 subscribers and has received nearly 3 million views, if you can imagine, and she'll give you a little taste of that here tonight. Sorry She's, in advance. what's that? I said sorry in advance. Sorry in advance, no, there's no apologies necessary. <laughs> She's currently working on new programming for HLN. They have hired Rachel and her partner to produce four episodes of a new programming. Uh, that will be, I think, very exciting and very interesting to a lot of people who enjoy travel. She is one of those very fortunate people that has seen many, many parts of the world at a very young age. 
Not only is it amazing all that she's done, but frankly, I think it's amazing that she's here this evening. Up until Monday, she was in Africa where she had spent a few weeks doing, among other things, an incredible safari experience and climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. She flew back to the States on Monday to her home in Los Angeles and she has agreed to join us here this evening for which I am eternally grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Rachel Rutherford. Donuts are good, don't get me wrong. So when I entered Miami, I knew that 
What I wanted to do was know the world. As soon as I got to Miami, I enrolled in international studies and Spanish language degrees. I also elected to use all my electives to study as many foreign languages as I could. Don't ask me how many I speak, I've lost most of them. But knowing that there are so many countries and so many cultures, that, that was where I wanted to be. Not only did I try to engage by learning about various countries and languages, but Miami gave me the opportunity as well to really connect with the community in different ways outside of the classroom. So I helped to integrate international students when they first arrived in Oxford, Ohio. I taught Buddhist monks how to golf, <laughs> which is funny because I don't golf. <laughs> That's better than they were. Okay, and this is with a group that helps Tibetan refugees in India. So um, <laughs> that was a really fascinating weekend. I also worked with all types of people through living in what is called a living learning community. Miami offers this now, and all first year residents are required to be a part of a living learning, learning community. So I was a part of the diversity door, which still honestly in Oxford, Ohio could probably be more diverse, but the fantastic thing about it is everybody when they enter Miami gets to choose what kind of people they'd like to learn from when they're there their first year. So you learn from them socially, you also engage with them through coursework that you're required to do that first year. And for me, it was just, it was all about learning. I also used my time at Miami to study abroad. So this is something that I think is fascinating and available to so many people now. I went to Spain to study for my Spanish degree. And I also went to St. Andrews, Scotland because they had great international relations courses. The thing about wanting to explore and also about wanting to study nowadays, frankly, <clears throat> is that it's expensive. I'm sure you've seen the numbers going up and up. College, I think, is, is increasing by 6% a year, something like that, in terms of cost. So when I entered Miami, I knew that I had no help from my family. They couldn't support me financially. So I worked really hard to get scholarships. And I know a lot of kids that did, and that also worked on the side. So I was really fortunate to earn a number of scholarships a year. Thank you for the scholarships, by the way, which helped me keep my grade point average on point because I had to, because I would lose the scholarships, right? But a lot of these scholarships were provided by potentially people in this room, by individuals and by foundations. I got scholarships for GPA, for course of study. I had financial aid from the Women's College to go to Dubai senior year and present research on women in leadership in media to this amazing group of women from around the world. And I got to learn from them about what leadership means in their various communities. And all of that was because I had the support of scholarships and financial aid in the financial aid department at Miami University. Okay, so storytelling. <laughs> How do you get into storytelling? If you grew up in Ohio, like nobody, I mean, people work in TV, but not really work in TV. The, um, the craziest thing that probably happened to me in life was between junior and senior years of college. I was in Scotland, I was studying, I wanted to explore for a living. I didn't know what that meant. I thought maybe I'd be a diplomat. And thankfully, that's not where I ended up, because you have to wear pantsuits every day. <laughs> it's horrible. So I got this internship with a travel company called STA Travel. STA Travel was, at the time, the world's largest youth and student travel provider. They helped plan trips for millions of people a year. They were doing what they were calling their first ever world traveler internship, which I, I still kind of pinch myself about. I'm like, this seems not like a real thing. But they were looking for somebody to travel to 15 countries over three months in the summertime to, quote, inspire others to travel, which is not that hard to do. If you show somebody a picture of a palm tree, they're like, yeah, please, I'll be there. So they wanted somebody to do blogs, photography, and video. 
The incredible thing is there were a lot of people, I think, who were better qualified, who would study journalism, communications. But because of my experience studying abroad a couple of times, I think the company was like, well, she won't die. <laughs> and she likes to communicate, so that's good. So they sent me. Off I went. I went to Europe, to Asia, and to Australia to do things like work with giant pandas in rural China, and to go scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef, to track with the hill tribes of Thailand. As soon as I got back to LA, excuse me, back to Miami, I knew I wanted to move to LA. I'm ahead of myself <laughs> already, I got so excited. So I went back to Miami and I was like, I have to, I have to be a storyteller, I can't be a diplomat. I can't do something where I don't communicate with everyday people about how fascinating the world is. So I started reaching out to people in a variety of cities that I knew had entertainment bases, and I was like, please may I learn from you? And not having a base in storytelling, I don't know, I figured I'd cast a wide net. I would essentially cold call people, but email style, via LinkedIn and their websites. And I would ask for an informational interview. Do people in the audience know about informational interviews? So some are saying yes, some are saying no. The magic of the informational interview or informational meeting is that when you reach out to somebody and you say, I'd like to learn from you, you're not saying, can you give me a job? Because when you say, can you give me a job, or I'm looking for work, are you hiring? That opens the conversation to one word, yes, or no. Somebody at Miami, and I don't know who this is, I owe them my eternal gratitude. Somebody told me about the informational meeting. Whoa. Sorry. Things are happening with my mic. So I reached out and I was like, can I learn from you? And probably to 100 people. I thought I'd hear back from 10. I think I heard back from 80, 85. And not only did I learn from these people, they were so gracious, they shared their wisdom that they had gathered over the course of an entire career. Then those people ended up being my friends, my colleagues, my mentors. A person who ended up really coloring my path and having a giant effect on where I am today is named Jeff Conroy. Jeff Conroy is the president of a TV production company in LA. And they produce a lot of manly man shows. So if any of you heard of Deadliest Cat, or Ice Road Truckers, or Axemen, we got a couple hands. Okay, this is a little stuff where there's like, you know, what's that? Well, okay, so speaking of, these are all these men's shows, but I was the only woman who was up in the Arctic, usually for three and a half months at a time. I was the only girl. Um, I had this great opportunity to help be a part of the storytelling on these shows because I emailed Jeff Conroy, cold call style, on LinkedIn, asking for an informational interview. But the thing that made this slightly different than the other times was he's a Miami alum. Right? How cool was that? He ended up being the first person that gave me a real chance in TV because he was willing to take the time to talk to me and teach me, he let me learn from him. And those opportunities to learn translated into my entire career as I know it. So then, what's really fascinating about being a part of the Miami community is then that led to producing shows about loggers, and pilots for National Geographic and Discovery Channel, History Channel. I even flew some of the planes, and I, I drove the 18-wheelers, the semi-trucks over ice, which you should not call the insurance companies about, because I'm pretty sure they didn't, no. <laughs> yep, no, they didn't. I produced an educational travel series for students in Thailand. I produced and hosted for Travel Channel, where I got to go paragliding, with a hawk as my guide. It's a real thing, it's called para-hawking. No joke, you strap in, you run off a cliff, 
my mom didn't love this idea. And then the falcon guides you to the best thermals. And then it'll circle back, it'll eat like little pieces of rabbit off your glove and then fly with the wind again. That was a work moment for me, which is magnificent. So about a year and a half ago, I launched my own travel series with a colleague, Andrea Fetchko. She and I are both producers and on-camera hosts, and we both travel a lot with work. So I've been to about 50 countries, and she's been to probably 30. And we realized it was time to quit hogging all the fun and the information and start sharing it with other people. But on top of that, when you're watching a travel show, Usually, you see men hosting, right? All right? Anthony Bourdain is great at what he does. It's usually ghost shows and food shows, man gorgeous self in foreign country. I want to be that person gorging myself. So the fascinating thing, too, is that these insurance companies, travel insurance companies, show statistically more women travel solo than men. It's neat, right? So where are we? Well, we decided to create a series. We produce it, we shoot it, we host it, we edit it, we put it out there to the world. And today we've put out 73 episodes as of this morning. The latest episode is about ATVing in Mexico. I would not recommend ATVing. Not very safe. Do you know what they are? They're the four wheelers. Not safe. We found that out while we were filming. But we wanted to be a voice for women and for armchair travelers and for young travelers and also for people who think the world might be frightening or intimidating. Because I'm sure we've all seen the news lately. It doesn't look great out there. But when you travel, you find that people are the same everywhere. And if we can share how exciting the world is with people and how human humans are everywhere you go, we figure we might all be better off. So since you've done such a nice job of listening to what I do, I'd love to actually show you what I do. Is anyone interested in learning about Tokyo? Great, perfect. As a matter of fact, I have a video that we could watch. Okay. So, please raise your hand if you find that the audio is not right, and we can always figure that out. How's that for a face of mother with love? <laughs> I'm in the purple, I know we look like twins, but we've only met through work. <laughs> Tokyo! It's the capital of Japan. It is the largest metropolitan area in the world with over 13 million Buddha-loving, sushi-loving, anime-loving, it's also been called the world's most expensive city, the most Michelin star, and the most livable megalopolis. But how does it really measure up? Hey, how to crew? I'm Andrea Fetchko. And I'm Rachel Runwall. There is a ton to see and do in Tokyo, so here is the short list. Shibuya Crossing. It is the world's busiest crosswalk, and it's got shopping. Uh, Meiji Shrine, which is dedicated to the modernizing leader, Emperor Meiji. Harajuku. Crazy Japanese fashion. Big famous by Gwen Stefani. The Metropolitan Government Building. You can get an aerial view of the city for free, which is key because most places charge 30 bucks a pop. If you see a photo booth, go into it. As Rachel shows, they automatically make your eyes bug eyed and like cat eyes. And they add the little details. Hello, oh, your hair. And my personal favorite, Tsukiji tuna option, which was made famous by Jiro Dreams of Sushi, the documentary. Only 120 visitors are permitted to get in each morning. So you're gonna get there by about 4 a.m. to actually get in. Ooh, is it it's so worth it. Japan's best export is food and drink. Absolutely. They're known for sake, sushi, ramen, and green tea flavored sweets. You wake up. You have to go to Ramen Street. It is a bunch of ramen places in Tokyo's main train station. Next to the train station, Maranochi, which is just one floor of a building that is full of amazing restaurants and bars. I recommend sake tasting at Moose Moose. Is it five o'clock yet? <laughs> so weird. Dago Sushi is the freshest sushi that I have ever had. It's in the center of Tsukiji Fish Market, and you have it for breakfast. That's a, that is impressive. You gotta admit. I committed to shabu shabu. It is so healthy, so.
so yummy. And definitely get the raw egg. Crazy protein snack. <laughs> I've taken the Ginza district, which is like the fifth avenue of Tokyo. It's really safe, it's really clean. There's just not a whole lot going on at night. And I stayed in uh, Sakusa, which is an older neighborhood, more working class, but it has great work reviews, temples, and good. Ginza and Omichisando are great places to shop. It's high-end retail, and the window displays are phenomenal. Shibuya has a lot of malls and a lot of comic book stores. Nakamise is Souvenir mm -hmm. Central. It's in route to Sensoji Temple, and it's got everything that you want to bring back home. From chopsticks to mugs to beautiful woodblock prints. So what's the verdict for Tokyo? Go or no? For Tokyo, I'm going to say go! People said that Tokyo is going to be very, very expensive. It felt similar to New York or another major metropolitan city. So it is within reach. It's very clean and there's so much to do. So you never get bored and it's really worth the trip. What about you, Rachel? I say go. First off, love the food. Ooh. Okay. I thought everything would be more creepy crawly and so less approachable, but I loved everything that I tried. So good. I also love the mix of old and new. So you might have one street that's all neon lights and another that is tea gardens and temples. And everything is efficient and organized. Thank you. So if you're a foreign traveler and you're traveling in a place with a completely different alphabet and script, would you understand trains and buses and bathrooms? It makes travel easy. Because toilets can just trip you up so easily. Listen, in Japan they're high tech. They're bidets. Well, high tech bidets. Okay. So that is two goes. Let us know in the comments below what city you want us to review next. Yeah. Just changed to blue. I'm 
sorry, I might lull you to sleep. But you're all here because you know the world is fascinating. You're here to learn about it. Our world is comprised of 200 plus nations. And I just learned this recently, over 6,500 spoken languages. Did you know that? 6,500? I mean, I'm pretty good at English, I'm getting the hang of it, but 6,500 is a lot. And that means that there are innumerable human beings and beliefs and cultures to get to know as well. And I know I'm not the first person to posit the idea that we're better when we're connected and when we open ourselves to one another. So just last week I was in Zambia and I had the opportunity to speak at an international school to students between ages 11 and 17. This school, because it's international, offers an incredible mix of cultures. So there were kids who'd grown up in Zambia, but whose parents were Jamaican and Chicagoan. <laughs> yes. There were people who lived in five or six countries, but their parents were in the foreign service. Still others who grew up in Delhi and London and recently moved to Lusaka, the capital, with their families. But for all the fascinating backgrounds, there was still this notable lack of imagination and self-belief in terms of what was available to the students for career paths. And I think that's probably normal. That probably happens in school systems in US as well. That's why I was invited to speak there. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an engineer. I'm really not a business person. Those are all amazing careers, obviously, but those are the only ones that some kids know about. I was there to tell them that they can dream about the thing that they want to dream about, that that's okay, and beyond okay, it can be real. And the magical thing is, somebody told me that, somebody's, a lot of people told me it was okay to believe in something crazy, to believe in this aspiration that I could travel the world and get paid for it, that I could teach people about our planet, that I could work in TV, it took parents and friends and educators to tell me it was okay. And more than okay, they told me I was enough, right, for whatever I wanted. I was enough. I just had to work hard. So hopefully, in speaking with the students in Zambia, that's the conversation we had. They learned that they are enough with hard work and with belief. And what I would really love is down the line someday to see these people again and hear about their jobs as astronauts and about their jobs as fashion designers, about pro soccer player gigs. I'd really like that. And I saw their twinkly eyes when they talked about the dream, so I think that that is possible. And on the subject of youths with big dreams, has anyone in this room heard of Inside Hollywood? We've got some good nods, okay. Inside Hollywood is a fascinating program. It's a program that I think is only about three years old, but it takes students from Miami who want to work in entertainment, and it brings them to LA for three weeks. So in January, there's a group of 16 students, and in May, there's a group of another 16 and they immerse themselves entirely in the entertainment industry. They shadow entertainment professionals, they go on sets, they get to go see Conan behind the scenes. His forehead really is that big, no joke. And they're completely enveloped in this world. And beyond that, they're actually working with Miami alums. A really impressive roster of Miami alumni live in the Los Angeles area. So these are the people who are taking students on to shadow them. And of course, Jeff Conroy, whom I mentioned earlier, he was my boss and my mentor, the first person who gave me a shot. He's a mainstay in the Inside Hollywood program, and everybody thinks he's the coolest. They're like, what? You work on the shows in Alaska? So they all want to hang out with him. A group of alumni and I actually lead a discussion with these students, and similarly to what I had the opportunity to do in Zambia, all we want to do is sit down with people and take the questions that they might be nervous to ask people in the big wig jobs over dinner, uh, empower them in their storytelling journeys. They're bright, they're 
driven, they're great conversationalists, and beyond that, they have this great Midwestern work ethic. They don't act entitled in the way that a lot of young people do now. They don't expect things to just happen for them because they're special snowflakes. They say please and thank you. It's magic. Whatever you're doing in this room, keep doing it. I think we need look no further for success stories that are already in the works than the 18 of 9 program, which again, Ray was way ahead of me. He mentioned all the good points ahead of time, so he gave you like the bullet points. This, he was the great PowerPoint to what I'm now fleshing out for you. The 18 of 9 program strives to recognize people who have graduated within the last nine years and made contributions to their career field. So in the last two years where people were recognized, there was a teacher who was educating students in the harsh conditions of Afghanistan. There was a coach to Olympic speed skaters. There are people who are working in their communities to better opportunities in education, in housing, in employment. They're incredible people in this group. And one of my absolute favorite people in the group is named Beth Stelling. She was recognized last year. She's a comedian. So if anybody is into comedy, I mean, you might get offended by her jokes. So I'm just, ear mouse. Um, she, she's been on Conan O'Brien, and she's been on Chelsea Handler's show, Chelsea Lately, so a lot of the comedy shows. I might be biased. We played field hockey together, and we did speech and debate when I was in high school, but I think People are just in awe of Beth. I don't think it's that I'm biased. I went to see her at a show in LA, and I hadn't seen her in years. And so we decided to grab a bite after her show. She did stand up, she was excellent. And we walked out of the theater, and people were clamoring to meet her. I mean, they were pretty much groupies. <laughs> and they were like, Beth, Beth. And they all wanted to learn from her and just have a moment in the sun. And she was so receptive and so sincere in the way that she received them that I was amazed. And I became more amazed when one woman came up after the entire group of people had passed, 10 minutes later, say. She's in a wheelchair, and she wants to talk to Beth about whether or not she has a shot at getting into comedy, given her backstory. So instead of Beth moving on to dinner, Beth sits down. And Beth talks to her for 10 minutes, and they laugh and they share stories, and they share wisdom and goals. And Beth is really just human in that moment. And she's kind and she's giving, just because. But it's not just because of who Beth is. Beth is a great human being. It's also because she has the values that I think everyone in this room shares. Knowledge, compassion, community, and hard work. These are things that we are taught, that are bred into us by the amazing community in Oxford, Ohio. And theoretically through some of our families too, if we're lucky enough. These are the values that I believe are sacred, and they make everything worthwhile. So if these are the stories of people from just the last 10 years, Imagine what the next 10 years might be like. And then, the 10 after that. That means that your grandchildren, my grandchildren, which is a ways off, <laughs> yeah, we're just being honest, each one of them will live in a better world, a more compassionate world, a more connected world, simply because these people exist. So I'm speaking with you today about my path. Not only my path though, the path of every individual that comes out of Miami that's changing his or her community. I hope that you felt at least a little bit encouraged about what we young folks are up to these days. Even if some of us spend too much time on Facebook. My Nana does too though, so don't hate, okay? I hope you also continue to feel connected 
to the value that a Miami education holds. And before we leave, I'd like to pose a couple of questions. These questions are to all of you, and I'm going to ask them of myself as well. I'd like you to each answer in your own ways. The answers might be different every day. I'd like to ask ourselves how we can better foster our connection to the Miami community and become a more active part of the positive work that it inspires. Being here is a big step, but every day forward obviously can be too. Beyond that, I'd like to ask ourselves how we can take the support and the teaching that we've received from educators like those with us in this room here, they all stood up at the beginning, they deserve a huge round of applause, how do we take their support and their teachings and better love and honor our world? So even if you just have water at this point, I'd like to propose a toast. To love and honor the Miami way. Thank you.
for a woman who's an on-camera host. The sad thing is there isn't a long shelf life. Everybody knows that, unless you're Paula Dean and you're supposed to be cooking like home cooking, right? Where you can look how you look when you home cook. That wasn't supposed to run, but it just happened. There isn't the same opportunity for women to continue to be trusted as experts beyond the point of when people think that they look a certain way. What I really like is to establish myself as somebody who knows enough that people continue to listen. And I'd really like to be so connected with my audience, which Andrea and I are now, are very connected with our audience. I'd like to be connected enough that as I grow older, they grow older, and we continue to believe in one another, and they still like learning about the world from me. That's what I'd really like. Yeah. Have you uh, ever been on the Orient Express? I have not been on the Orient Express, but if you have any connections, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> No, I'd love to go. I also want to do Trans-Siberian Railroad. That would be nice. Yes? Yes. Cuba on your list. Given my background in Spanish, is Cuba on my list? If I didn't have a background in Spanish, Cuba would be on my list. Because I have a background in Spanish, Cuba is so on my list. I'd really like to get there before it opens up all the way and the injection of foreign currency really changes the whole landscape. That's what I'd like, to see it when there are still cars from the 50s, old beaters and the peeling paint. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes? Where haven't I been that I'm really looking forward to? Nepal has been at the top of my list for a long time. I'd really like to go there and do some trekking in the Annapurna circuit. I'd like to go to Burma or Myanmar. I'd like to go to Bhutan. What's cool about Bhutan is it's this tiny little mountain kingdom in the middle of Asia. And instead of measuring GDP or GNP, they measure what they call gross national happiness. Yep. <laughs> and so they intend to measure education, health, things like that, as opposed to just national output and how much people are making. And all in all, people are said to be pretty happy and healthy. It's also quite expensive to get in there and your visas per day cost a lot. So that's probably later in life for me. And I've saved up. Yeah. She said, I seem fearless. Thank you. <laughs> and she also asked, is there anything I'm afraid of? The truth is, I'm scared of a lot. But it's what I do with it. Anybody in this room would know that there are lots of scenarios where you're scared. I was scared walking onto this stage. I could have said no, but you'd have to be crazy. Right? To not connect with this room of people, that would have been a crazy answer for me to say no. So I'm afraid of a lot, but the question that I have to ask myself every time that I'm facing fear is, what do I do with that fear? How do I listen to that fear and harness it and make it something good? There are times where you're afraid for good reason. I mean, if you're going to get mugged, you should probably run, right? Use the fear and run really fast. But there are other times where you're afraid because you don't know what will happen. You might fail. You have to learn from that. You also have to fess up to it, tell your friends they did do a good job. What fun is that? So I just aim to take fear, figure out what it means, do something good. Maybe that becomes something more beautiful than I imagined. Yeah. Yes? So if you could take one trip to Europe, where would it be and why? If I could take one trip to Europe, where would it be and why? What are you into? <laughs> you looking for recommendations? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, yeah, it's totally dependent on, on every person in this room as far as what might interest you. For me, there are a couple of places. And I am biased. I lived in Spain, so I love Spain. I love it, because I had a chance to actually be a part of it just for a moment in time. but see all the color and the magic, 
the flavor, the, the passion with which people live, that's inspiring. Scotland, I'm biased, I live there too. I mentioned the magic of Spain. In Scotland, people actually, I think, believe in magic still. Like, they still believe in fairies and stuff, which is pretty fun. And they're also good potato-fed people. They just like to have fun. They curse a bunch. I support it. Sounds funny with the accent, right? A good brogue is hard to find. So, I would also say, though, there are a lot of places in, in more Eastern Europe that have not been so overwhelmed by tourism yet, and so they still hold some of that feeling that they're from the past, that you're almost intruding on a space that not everybody's discovered, and that's really fascinating. So I would say Budapest is still that way. <coughs> Busted. <laughs> Prague, for example, is gorgeous, but it feels like Disneyland. But if you go a little further east to Bratislava, Slovakia, it looks the same way, and it has these weird remnants of Soviet history and the you know, the block housing on one side of the river and then this beautiful architecture on the other. So I, I'd say go further east, go to Riga. Riga looks like a play world. Iceland's magic too. So pretty much everywhere, just look at a map and then maybe all of it would be good. One more question. One more question. That was an enthusiastic hand. Good night, everyone.